Hi everyone, good evening uh, to Developer Circles community uh, in Jerusalem, Kyiv and Rome, a collaboration event. So hello, shalom, privet, and ciao. Uh, we are here today, uh, uh, the four of us, uh, me, Tomka, Maria, and Enzo from the Developer Circle community. Uh, as part of our Circles uh, community, uh, global community challenge. And with us, uh, we have Olga to talk about uh, our event today, which is about uh, crowding. Uh, Olga? Yep. Um, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to be able to chat about localization with you guys. Um, I'm really open to any kind of questions and I really hope that tonight we're going to have some fun, um, get some, I don't know, new insights and um, yeah, and just, just get it started, I guess. Um, this is the first slide of my uh, presentation. So, you know, before we start talking about localization, I would really just, you know, share a few words about uh, me and maybe my company that I work for right now. Um, I'm Olga. Um, I work for a crowding company. Uh, we've been on the market more than for 10 years. And here you can actually check like few of our clients. Um, crowding is localization management tool. It's a SaaS service. Um, so basically, it's not only the documentation localization we're going to talk uh, today about, but it's also web apps, mobile apps, uh, localization, knowledge based localization, design localization, like mockups and everything. Basically, anything that you as a developer would need to localize, right? Um, yeah, so let's get straight to the point. Um, you know, before we, we look into the deep, I would say so, um, uh, let's, I, I just would like you really to share like a few basic things, you know, maybe for those people who are not familiar with localization like at all. Um, and I would start, you know, with the basic project roles, like what kind of responsibilities people uh, have, you know, in, in the localization uh, mm -hmm. circle. So first of all, localization, it's not only about translators, right? It's also about project managers, uh, proofreaders, uh, developers, definitely, designers, and basically any team member, you know, who can help and, you know, somehow manage the process. So first, we're going to talk about translators role, people who translate from the basic language or the source language to the target locales. Um, then we have a proofreader, somebody who takes care of existing translations. Usually translator and proofreader make it, you know, it makes a perfect combination. They usually work together. Um, then we have a project manager role, a person who would basically handle uh, team members, right? Uh, get in touch, uh, deliver tasks, uh, tasks on time and everything, plus the resources like um, the source files, um, translation memory, glossary, and basically anything that team would need, you know, to have in supply in order to do their job. So in terms of the resources, um, first thing on the list for today, it would be about the source files, right? Uh, source files, it's basically the files we need to translate, again, from our source language to the target language. Uh, source files, they consist of the keys, like identifiers and source values, source values that we kind of um, get from our code, like localization elements that we need to translate. Um, at this point, I guess I should also say that crowding is file-based system. So we usually expect files to be uploaded into crowding, but we also can work with a single keys. Like you can also push single keys for localization and get it back. Um, the suggestion. Suggestion is simply the proposed translation because definitely in the localization projects, especially in crowdsource projects, you can have multiple translation suggestions, you know, added to a single string. And then you would need to pick up the one, right? Because like we, we can only uh, integrate one translation for one source value. Um, then we have approvals. Approval, it's a, it's a job of the proofreader because proofreader reviews the translation and if it's perfect, we put a validation check mark saying, okay, it's cool, we, we take it into production. Vote system. It's a special thing when translators can vote, upvote or downvote for translations made by other people, by other translators in the project. Um, it's usually very, very popular in crowdsource projects where translations are being, you know, done by volunteers because, you know, um, in a company like private companies, we know they do the localization. They usually have their own in-house translators 
or they have the translation you know agency that does all of the stuff for them so world system it's usually very popular for crowdsourcing um, then we have translation memory basically it's a set of previously translated texts let's say um 10 years ago i translated a word and then uh, 10 years after I, I submit the same source value or a similar source value, crowding would remember everything, every single word, every single phrase that was ever translated in crowding project. And then you can reuse these translations all over again. And glossary, basically a dictionary, it's a set of project specific terms. Uh, you might ask, what are the specific terms in localization, right? But, you know, usually it, it depends on field. For example, if we translate some, I don't know, medicine stuff, we would have some, you know, medical terms to be um, translated the same way across all of, the, let's say, the application, right? When we talk about the games localization, it might be, you know, some specific names of the, I don't know, levels, features, whatever stuff we have. If it's, uh, I don't know, documentation localization, it might be, you know, very specific terms dedicated to, to options, to integrations, to a lot of different stuff. Okay, here we go. Um, and right now, let's get uh, yeah, into in, into into the point. And before we would talk about you know documentation, I've got second slide on list. I would first like really much uh, to talk about the general localization pro process for applications. Um, web application, mobile applications like Android and iOS systems. And here I got like, you know, I've got a list here, like a list of differences between localization of the applications and localization of documentations. Um, in order to, to show you that, I'd like to get into crowding project right now. I got one prepared on my own. I forked uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, Visual Studio Code uh, documentation to talk about that. And before looking into that, I would really like to show you how crowding handles like the very general and very uh, common application uh, localization. So thing we've got right now, it's a crowding project. Uh, it's a view of the resources, like the source files uploaded into crowding for localization. Um, I mentioned that crowding is a file-based system, and it's very true. Uh, we also support a lot of different file types, uh, JSON, Android, XML, whatever framework you guys are using, you can simply upload you know, your source file into crowding. We would automatically recognize it. We would automatically segment it based on the keys. If it's a key value fi a file type, then basically one key would be considered in crowding as one segment for localization. So. If talking about the difference between app localization and uh, documentation localization, uh, applications, uh, they all consist of very short messages, very short term terms that we are supposed to translate, right? Uh, we would, I guess we would never come across like the key from the application, which would be like 10 sentence long, right? It's not, it's not possible. Uh, so, for example, here uh, we would always see, you know, like middle or very short keys that we are supposed to translate from our application. We don't need uh, to have a connection between those keys, you know, like it's a demo, it's, a, it's an option about customers, it's an option how to create a project, you know, different buttons. So, these are the short uh, texts and they are not being connected with each other. Like, we don't need to learn how, you know, we don't need to learn translation for this key in order to provide translation for another key. But in um, in documentation, right, when we translate guides, tutorials, articles, it's crucial to be able to recognize, okay, if this is, a, you know, like the beginning of the uh, of my article that I'm translating, and this is the end. And in order to provide the best translation, I would need to, to see the context, right? I would need to see the quality. Um, the coherence between those segments. So this is the main difference in terms of the, just in terms of the text. Uh, documentation, it's always long segments of text, very static text, which are not usually, you know, updated or changed. We have an article, we translate it, we push the localized version for, uh, you know, into the, uh, into the production and that's it. We almost never come back, you know, to change something in the article. And in crowding, we've got this special uh, preview option for tutorials and guides, usually they are being handled through uh, Markdown, HTML, docx files. Um, it's not only you know the articles and tutorials; it's also blogs, um, knowledge bases. Uh, I don't know anything you know that would consist 
very static, big amount of text of content for translation. So in query, we have this preview option when each segment is being connected with the previous uh, with the previous segment. In this way, for translators, it's really easy to understand, you know, like the the uh, connection between those things, and you know, provide a good quality translation for the whole article. And what is better, uh, it's also possible to. Um, to preview the translation you're doing. For example, if I would translate this very segment into, let's say, Japanese language, um, and I would click this magic icon, I would see, you know, the uh, I would see already localized Japanese version right here in Kraven for me for the translator. And this way, I can, you know, I can I can have a whole picture, like a whole puzzle for me. So I would understand that okay, my job is done. It looks nice. It's all clear, and you know, uh, coherence of the text is being preserved. While in the uh, application localization, we simply work, you know, on separate strings not being connected to, to each other. Um, but in this case, you know, whenever we work on single strings, the context is being really, really important for us. For example, I'm translating the product and I'm like, okay, what is the context of this string? Like, product of what? Is it like a web product, mobile product? Like, what is the product? And for this purpose, in coding, it's also possible to link screenshots, like extra information, just like that. So what I'm, I'm translating as a translator, I can always open the screenshot and look at the key, at the option, at the pop-up, whatever I'm translating, and see like, oh, it's a landing page. Okay, I got it. I mean, I, I'm translating that. Um, plus, a, in the app localization, it's really important to translate you know, those keys, the source values, um, in accordance to the source text in terms of the max length. Like, um, let's say we translate from English to German, right? And we know that German language usually have really long nouns, and usually like the verbs and nouns, they're, you know, a bit longer than in English. So while I'm translating, I might be like really, you know, worried about the length issues. Maybe my German translation would not be, you know, would not fit if I'm translating a button, right? Maybe a German localization would not fit simply into the size. So as a developer and as a project manager, you guys can set max limit to the proposed translation. For example, if we have a button demo and then um, we don't want uh, we don't want our translator, you know, to translate it too long for German. For German, we might say that it's like four characters max, and translator will not be able to exceed this limit. For example, if I'm trying to translate something like this and I'm trying to save it, Crowding would tell me, "Hey, your translation is too long. Please stick to the max." lens set by your project manager or by your developer and well I, I will need to think a bit you know just in order to match those uh, requirements or if as a translator i'm not really you know uh, i do not agree about this limitation i can always you know ping my manager right here saying hey guys increase the limit for me it's not possible you know to, to fit it into those uh few characters um okay and what else? Ooh, HTML tags, placeholders, uh, plurals, and ICU syntaxes. It's again for application localization. Um, apps localization, it's all about dynamic text, right? I mean, um, we had new keys deployed, then our content manager, I don't know, can see, oh, it's a typo there. Let's update source text and update localization for them. So in crowding, um, it's really easy to update source files. Again, it might be done manually. It might be done through the integrations like API or GitHub. But idea is that um, that if we work with dynamic content, I mean, we, we might have frequent updates and we might have such things as variables and placeholders. So in crowding, we do recognize those styles automatically. Whenever we have a, I don't know, a placeholder, basically any dynamic content, we highlight it and we usually give a, you know, give a hint to the translator that this specific variable, uh, like dynamic text, should not be translated. So as a translator, I should realize, oh, Okay, maybe I should not really touch it, or maybe I should not really translate it literally. Again, we're talking about right now, I'm talking about crowdsource projects. Uh, whenever it's not a translation agency, you know, who's skilled to handle those kind of things, but maybe the volunteers who help you with your apps localization, they might not know what is the variable, what is HTML tag. So in crowding, we would, you know, we would try to, to help those people to provide best quality translations, and whenever we would try to save it. Oh, I've got length issues here. I'm going to just 
to get rid of it. So whenever I'm trying to save the translation that might have some broken tags or even that might have some you know mistakes in terms of the variables and placeholders, crowding would also tell me, hey, please have another look. Maybe something you know could be improved and, and everything. Um, so one thing that we automatically highlight HTML placeholders and um, sorry, HTML tags and placeholder uh, placeholders, basically any dynamic content. And we give a hint to the translator that, you know, this kind of thing should not be literally translated, but simply preserved in the translation area. Um, we also handle such stuff as plurals and uh, ICU syntax. Uh, for example, you know, some file types like Android XML, um, GetXP or files, they support pluralization forms. So um, we can generate one key, but you know, with the different types of, um, of the plurals translation to provide. And if let's say uh, in this project, I do, I do have English as a source language. So I uploaded this particular key to be translated into what I have here, German, Arabic, and Japanese. So crowding automatically recognized this is, uh, that this is a pluralization. And for German language, we know that German locale does have two plural forms, singular one and other for plurals. So what we do, we automatically provide translator with two options. So translation for both plural and singular forms, you know, can be submitted. Um, if we're talking about, let's see, Arabic languages, uh, Arabic language, Crowding automatically recognize that for this particular language, it's actually the sixth plural form that are supposed to be entered right here. So translator would need to know that, okay, I need to provide six variants because this is a singular, and then you know this is uh, the plurals. But plurals, of course, they have you know uh, different different stuff like too few, many other forms, you know, to cover those uh, pronouns and everything. Uh, yep, for those file types that do not natively support pluralization because it depends not on the you know not, not on the platform like crowding, but actually on the file format itself and its documentation. For those file types that do not support pluralization, uh, Crowdy have um, another thing. It's an ICU syntax that can be implemented basically in any file type, including spreadsheets, JSON, um, I don't know, um, YAML files, uh, whatever comfortable for you. And then using this ICU syntax, we can also handle plural forms and we can handle you know all of the gender specific details, currency details, uh, all of it together. Definitely all of this stuff, it does not simply exist in documentation localization because in documentation we have, you know, like a static article with no placeholders. There might be some HTML text as well, but no placeholders, no variables, and no pluralization, no ICU syntax rule, and, and that's it. Okay. And uh, for the application localization, we also, oh, the context, yeah, I mentioned that. And for the uh, documentation localization, yeah, I also mentioned the preview. So maybe just, you know, just to sum it up, like the documentation localization and uh, application localization difference in few ways. First one is that documentation, it's all about the long segments of text. We have long segments of uh, text, each uh, linked to each other. So in order to provide the best quality translation, translators would need to have coherence of the text, would need to have a preview to uh, to follow from the very first segment to the last one and, uh, and make sure they, they, they have a good translation. For application localization, it's a bit simpler. I mean, in terms of the tags, because it's short tags, not connected to each other. Uh, we can have context, you know, like special uh, screenshots, you know, to provide uh, good translations. But in this way, it's easier. Uh, but then it comes to placeholders, then it comes to the HTML tags and plurals and ICU forms. These are the pitfalls, if I, may, if I might say it so, of the localization uh, of applications, because usually it's, um, it's really hard to cover that from the very beginning, especially if you're a newbie to localization. But as far as gets, um, I would say that like systems like crowding, uh, they are usually prepared, you know, to handle all those subtleties. And it's really cool if, if you could, you know, just add all of these elements, you know, from the very beginning. Okay, let's get further. Oh, machine translations. Um, it's, a, it's a special topic for today because I guess uh, localization nowadays does not really happen without machine translations. Um, 
based on my experience and based on the customers and on the project that we have here in Croding, I would say that almost everybody, like 90% of the customers are using machine translations, not because they are lazy or they do not have an agency, you know, to translate, but this is like the very basic things um, in our time. Uh, nobody wants to translate, you know, everything from scratch without having a hint or without having, you know, a tip. So machine translations here in Croding, uh, actually they, they provide this base, they provide this, you know, start point for translators, you know, just to, uh, jump straight to the um, to the process, and in crowding we we have few machine integrations that you can actually choose from. Uh, it's Google, it's Microsoft, it's uh, IBM, it's Amazon. Actually, I'm going to show you guys what we have here. Microsoft, Google, also Google AutoML, Yandex, Deeple, Watson, IBM, Amazon Translate, and the last one but not the least, it's Crowding NMT, Crowding Translate Engine engine it's our own machine uh, machine translation provider um we have our own data scientist in the department the guys who are working on the engine uh i would say it's a young thing it's a young machine provider but it's really cool and we keep keep you know improving that keep keep adding you know the the, uh, the language pairs uh, so they would be uh, available for different kind of languages and you can use this machine provider crowding translate for free and it looks like this way. Translators work on their untranslated text. And instead of, you know, doing everything on their own, like typing everything, they would have those hints right here. Uh, for German language, it would be German localization. For Japanese, it would be Japanese. In this way, we can actually, you know, make the whole work easier. We can save time. Uh, we can save money because um, nowadays it's getting popular simply to pre-translate all your files using machine translations and then just you know pay the proofreader to review all those machine translations making sure all of them are okay um i'm a big fan of machine translations actually and uh, i would not claim you know that all of them like are perfect or something but it's it's really um it's really um given that Machine translations, they are really good for small segments of text, like for titles, for buttons, for some, you know, uh, short elements, which I usually, you know, they usually happen happening in the localization of the, the uh, applications. They might be not so cool for documentation localization because we've got this, you know, long segments of text and, you know, it's not always the case that machine translation would be the perfect one. But anyway, it's a great, you know, it's really a great way to um, just to save a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of money by using machine translations. Plus, it's a really cool thing for... Um, for the localization like you know when if you just maybe you know um you're not sure whether you want to start with localization or maybe you just want to have a look how approximately chinese localization of the english version would look like why not to pre-translate everything through machine engine integrate it somewhere like on the mirror project or something and this way understand you know how does uh, Chinese, how does French, how does German localization would look like? At least, you know, like the preview. So it's also popular nowadays um, with this kind of things. So um, as I mentioned in Crowding, we've got Crowding Translate. It's a young engine, but it's really cool. Uh, and instead of, you know, using uh, this machine translation for every single key, in crowding, we get such option as pre-translation. It means you can just pick up the source files in your project, pick up the languages, and run the whole uh, machine pre-translation for the whole bunch of files. I'm actually going to do uh, to run one uh, right now. Let me pick up this one, and yep, let's see what we'll have here. So what I did uh, just right now, I just run machine pre-translation for my three languages, Arabic, German, and Japanese, uh, using Crowding NMT. So I'm waiting, you know, till it's done, and then I just, you know, want to, you guys to have a look how it would look like. Um, okay. While it's in the in the process, I would also like to say that um, the Crowding NMT uh, um, machine provider 
can be used uh, you know, alongside with other machine translators because a lot of our customers, they use different kinds of machine providers to, to carry their, uh, the content. For example, the Microsoft Make Office, Make Code team, um, they also got you know, their project placed here in crowding. And if we would just uh, look through the uh, different kind of locales, they have different percentage because it's, uh, it's an open project where volunteers help with translations. But also Microsoft team, they use both Google, tra uh, Microsoft Translate and Crowding NMT Translator to pre-translate those you know, short segments, those languages that they can uh, cover. Oh, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a member of Italian translation. So I'm going to stick to, to, to another locale right here. By the way, guys, you can, you're, you're more than welcome to join, you know, all the open project that we have here in Crowding. They also include Dakuzaurus project. And as you can see, not a lot of the locales have 100% translations. So I think they would be really, you know, excited to have some, uh, you know, some help from the uh, developer circle developers. Um, the same for Django Girls and Minecraft team. They all of these projects they are open. Uh, anybody can join and help with translations. Um, okay, cool. I think that it's done. Actually, my pre-translation. So let's see how how it would look like for the translated files. Maybe not in this language. Maybe just in another one. So the whole idea of the machine uh, machine translators is that they are easy, they are cheap, and it's definitely a good point, you know, just to start with your localization right away. Okay. Crowdsource localization. It's my favorite topic for today because nowadays crowdsource localization is becoming more and more popular. And I think personally that it's really cool when you can actually translate your application through the help of your fans, through the help of, of people, you know, who use your application, who, who play your games, who, I don't know, who just love the programs, who love the application that you do. And here in Crowding, it's definitely possible to have your open source project created, developed, and deployed. Uh, one of the examples might be the Discord team. They have their... Um, the Discord platform uh, here in Crowding, uh, open for everybody to join and help. And once they um, they actually finished it, I mean, uh, I think the last year, they fully translated all of the languages using just the help of their fans, of their users. And right now, I think their website is already like multilingual. And they had like a really, really a lot of languages, something about 20 languages or even more, if I'm not mistaken. Another example of a great crowdsource localization project, it's might be like Microsoft community who help to translate and keep helping to translate the uh, Minecraft team. Uh, they have also like really nice description and a lot of instructions for their translators. So uh, whenever you join into the uh, crowdsource projects, you can see that, for example, the Ukrainian language is like 100% translated, but we also have like you know, some place for validations. And let's actually open and see what we have here. So crowdsource translation, what it is, as it's stated on my slide, it's a, it's a project where translation is not being provided by the translation agency, but instead it's being done by the volunteers, by the fans of the application games and programs uh, with no financial reward. Um, no financial reward, but still we have, uh, usually those crowdsource projects, they have some rewards for their top contributors, for their top translators. Uh, for example, like uh, my, a Minecraft team, uh, they had, if I'm not mistaken, some perks they, they did uh, give their top members, their top contributors, those capes, like, you know, special perks in a game. Um, I've never played Minecraft, so I, I, I don't know, but uh, I know that translators, they were pretty excited about that. And there were like a lot of people who were, you know, really doing great translations, really dedicating their time. So I think that crowdsourcing, it's actually also one of the ways to create your own community, maybe not even to create, but expand your community of users, uh, share some context, networking, you know, between translators, between different uh, people involved into localization. So the project we can see here, it's a Minecraft project right now. It's Ukrainian localization. And as you can see, almost all source values are being, you know, translated and pre-fret. 
under this section, we've got volunteers chatting, asking questions, uh, I don't know, talking about context, maybe best translations, discussing something. And for crowdsourcing, I just want to say that here in crowding, we, we've got a special voting system. Because if you guys, a private company, and you hire a translation agency who do everything, translate, proofread, make, you know, make sure translations are the best, and only those best translations would be taken from, let's say, crowding and integrated to the website or application, whatever. In crowdsource, um, we just have a big, big community of people who are not really translators, but who are fans of your application and who are able to help. It means that if you're a project owner, right, and you're having your app translated through the crowdsource, you don't have like this middle level. You have translators, you have the management part, but you don't have proofreaders, right? I mean, how you can know that, let's say, this Ukrainian localization is good. I mean, we don't know Ukrainian, right? So in crowding, we have a special voting system. For example, if we can see that any specific key has multiple, multiple translations, like a lot of people are submitting, a lot of people are proposing, and we're not sure like what to choose, what translation you know to pick up, because obviously for one key, we would always need you know one translation. We don't need to have 10 translations for the single source value, but in systems like crowding, it's always possible to provide various variants of translation, which you, we can see right now here. And if you as a, as a crowdsource translator, as a volunteer, you join the project, you want to help, you know, but everything is already translated. You can, you can still help and you can do actually the proofreading job. So instead of translating, you come and you just vote for those translations that you like the best. And this way you give a hint to the project managers, to the people who hold the project, that this very translation is the best one. It's, you know, definitely should be taken for, for the production. And basically you can ignore the rest of the translations, right? Um, yeah, so for crowdsource, we do have a special voting system and which is more important, we also have a special way of, um, of managing those things which, which happen in crowdsource uh, projects. These are usually the abusive stuff. Um, you know, when we're talking about the crowdsource, we're talking about public project exposed to everybody on the web who can join and translate. Um, in crowding, you can you can actually choose choose strategies. You can have fully open project where everybody could join with no approval, you know, with no regulations. Another option would be to have a project where um, where volunteers can join, but they would need to submit, you know, like a uh, like an like a request. The project manager would need then to approve and do the crowdsource fully opened, but still as a manager, you can control, you know, who's joining your project. And for example, Quadro team, they're doing that. You cannot simply, you know, uh, join and translate. You would need to submit a request. Even sometimes you can write a short paragraph why you want to join, why you want to translate, you know, what is your contribution in the project. But for those projects which are, you know, fully exposed to community, to, to everybody, uh, we have such thing as report abuse stuff. Um, if you have hundreds of people who would like to translate, there is always a chance that somebody would join and maybe, you know, just have some fun, not really translate, but, can, you know, simply uh, submit some, you know, different stuff. Um, if you notice that in crowdsource projects, there are people who are not really interested in submitting translations, who are not passionate about, you know, helping with localization, and they, you know, they provide bad quality translations or, they raise some, you know, discussions uh, right here in comment section, or they, you know, submit some abusive comments. You can always report abuse for this particular user. I mean, not for the particular one, of course, but you know, for anybody you would notice is not doing a good job. And project manager can always find this person and either delete them from the project so they would not be able, you know, to, to translate anymore, or they can even block those people so they would not even be able to join again. Basically, they're like blocked forever from the project. They're not able, you know, to do anything. So um, it might be a bit tough, you know, but especially for big projects like Minecraft, it's really necessary to have this kind of option for project managers, for coordinators, because, you know, this way we make sure only good people stay in the project. They do their best while those who are not really interested, um, you know, might spend their time, you know, in, in other places. Um, 
Okay. Uh, translators and proofreaders, quality control and reward for active volunteers. Quality control. Um, it's actually the thing I've been, I've been talking about. It, this, uh, it's all about this upvote and downvote systems. So uh, project coordinators could pick up the best translations in those languages they do not understand and they could, those languages they cannot translate. And for the um, for the presence and rewards, you know, for your top volunteers, well, definitely they don't get financial rewards uh, if it's a crowdsourced project. But it might be uh, any perks if you have, you know, game localization. If it's an educational project or simply um, web app application uh, localization, it might be a Twitter. A Facebook post saying, "Hey, thank you, Julia. Thank you, John. You know, for being so awesome and providing you know the best of translations you can. It might be a goodies package you can send to your top contributors saying thank you, guys. You know, for helping and everything. It might be a certificate or a recommendation letter. It's, it's especially it's it, it's topical for young volunteers like students. You know, who don't have a lot of experience, but they rely on the recommendation letter. You know, for their CV and everything." So there are a lot of a lot of different ways to say thank you for your volunteers without paying them, you know, like the financial reward. And basically, that that's what uh, that's what we have in crowding. I mean, each project they have special thanks, they have special ways, you know, of telling people that they really appreciate their work. Uh, we also have electron projects from GitHub. They also like translated, I guess, almost everything, or they, you know, or maybe they on the finish line. I'm not sure, but. They also have very strong community, you know, who help us translations, both translating and proofreading those suggestions. So it, it's it's really cool. Um, okay, Airtel languages localization. Oh, it's a. I know that it's a it's a nice subject to talk about because it's um, based on my experience. It's really hard to cover, you know, Airtel lan languages on the market, and usually there are no, you know. There is no perfect way, you know, how, how to handle it sometimes. But in crowding, uh, we also have a special thing, like a special mirror display for RTL languages, including Hebrew, Arabic, Persian, and, you know, and, and other languages. So um, I really hope that for people, you know, who, who work with RTL, it's convenient and it's nice to work with those languages. Plus, we always, you know, open for the, uh, for the feedback. We always want to uh, strive to make uh, you know the view and everything even better. So, if you guys uh, you know want to to participate in RTL localization or you have your project being localized into RTL, in crowding for your translators, it would be this kind of mirror view. So people could you know could just translate the way they can and save the translation, and it would be comfortable for them to work you know to work this way. Uh, because you know, for for let's say for European languages, for example, for German, it's a bit different view. It's like that. I mean, like for the European market, but for Arabic and for other things, it's always it's always like that. Um, maybe one thing that usually concerns me when I talk about the RTL, how to deal with uh, RTL localization when we have those special placeholders and HTML tags. Because again, based on my experience, it's it's always a pain point, you know. It's always a pain point because you can provide um, the best translation ever, but since it has variables and those variables were, was not put in the right place, uh, it might be not, you know, not not uh, let's say the best translation we can have. So, for example, in crowding, when we talk about source elements, which include placeholders, variables, HTML tags, basically any extra information, any dynamic tactical stuff which is not the source text um we would advise doing that thing uh let me see we have like this it's not a magic button but but for me it's really magic copy source text and then we always always recommend uh rtl translators to very um uh, slightly simply substitute the source elements with the translation I know it might, you know, looks so uh, so perfect right now, but since the uh, the order of those placeholders, the order of those text is preserved in the translation, when developer would integrate, would download translations from Chrome and would integrate them into the app, translation will be always correct, always preserving those order of the text or those order of the variables 
that was supposed to be in the source files, in the source text. So it means translation would never broke the app, it would never crash anything, and basically this is a, the, the recommendation I, I uh, could give uh, to the Airtel translators. Um, using this view for providing, and if you guys worried that you might miss up, you know, just messed up a little bit with those things, I would just advise using copy source and then very accurately substituting the source text with the target local uh, translation. And this way you can be sure nothing would be broken, nothing would be bad, everything should be really cool. Okay, let's jump to the next point, which is agile localization. Um, I guess this part is pretty technical and I really like it actually. So when we are going to talk about local, uh, lo uh, agile localization, I just want to say that we really love this stuff. I mean, we do uh, we do talk about crowding on the market as uh, as a tool for agile companies who work for the agile technologies and who also want you know to make agile localization. So when you guys start development of your application or development of new features, new integrations, there is no need to wait till let's say. You have everything, you know, written, uh, checked, and only then start localization. No, no way to do that. You can start localization right the moment you start developing any features or start writing your code for the next integration. Um, and we know how to handle it. We have a special system to handle duplicates. And just want to show you that localization can start at any point of the project, at any level. level. You don't need to have the keys you don't need to have your source file to start localization because if you have a designer who created a mock-up you know like a preview how the application should look like you can already translate you don't need to have you know those files integrated into crowding you can start with your designers and maybe just few points to um to to show the benefits of agile localization of course it lets you combine development and localization process together as i say any feature branch, any version branch that you start, you know, writing on a Git might be already, you know, included into localization pipeline. So you don't need to wait till you finish development, merge your feature branch into master, and then, you know, start translating. No, you can start translating right away. Um, translators can always access relevant text for translation. And that's very true because whenever you update the key or you push new keys, everything can be automatically submitted to crowding. Uh, right now, I'm talking about API, CLI, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket integrations, you know, and those stuff that make the process going on. Then we have ability to check translations in the process rather than after release. And it's also very true because those translations that you guys make in crowding, they usually automatically submitted to your repositories. So they can always rewrite, you know, like the, the old version of translations and everything. So this way, having those uh, continuous integration through the Git or through the API, you can always have translations, like the topical translations updated. And the last point, it's improving localization on the fly. It's basically basically a summary of everything that we discussed. Whenever you see a mistake, a typo, you want to submit a new key, you do it right away. You don't need to wait till the whole project you know, is being done and, uh, and submitted and only then you start localization. No, you can do that right away. Um, and right now, I want to talk about maybe a bit more, uh, a bit more um, technical stuff for developers who would need to take care of the localization uh, text. Um, in order to start with a GitHub, you know, or any of these things, um, you guys would need to have source files. So um, it would be necessary to, necessary to extract localization elements from your code and put it somewhere like a JSON, XML, YAML, QDTS files, spreadsheets, um, HTML, Markdown, or even docx files, whatever works fine for you. So whenever you do that, and let's say you have a separate repository with your localization resources, it's high time to use crowding, you know, just to integrate those things. And I'd like to uh, share an example on how to do that in my own project right now through the GitHub integration. Uh, what I like the most about this thing is that it's like really, really easy. I'm not a developer myself, but it, it takes like two minutes. Okay, maybe not two minutes, but five minutes for me to set up the integration. And I think it's really cool. So what I've got here, I've got my GitHub account connected and I've got, and I did fork the repository of Visual Studio Code with their documentation. So I'd like just to show how does this stuff works. So crowding GitHub or crowding GitLab, Bitpacket, Azure Repo, CLI, or API integration. 
uh, can be set up in order to provide you know uh, agile localization and the GitHub, it's actually the easiest, uh, you know, to, just to compare to others in integration stuff because you just need to pick up your repository right here. Crowding would display you all of the branches you have on the wrapper. So you can just, you know, choose the branches you'd like to localize right away. For example, like I did with my master branch. What does crowding do then? Based on your master, we would create a localization branch um, because all of the translations that are happening in crowding, we would never commit them directly to your master or any other base brain that you have in the repository because, well, it's obviously dangerous. You might have, you know, other stuff set up there. So we create our own localization branch where, where we would send you a pull request with crowding translations. Uh, if you're worried maybe about the access and like how crowding would know what to translate, what to not translate, um, that's because you might tell the system where you keep your source files. For example, here I did indicated a path to my source files like that. I wanted to translate a directory with release notes and then I just, you know, wanted to go ahead for everything that I had there, like for all my markdown files. It's definitely possible, you know, to play with a path. So if you have like a very complicated tree, you know, files tree and everything, it's still possible, you know, to make it work the way that you like. So we would only use we would only look into the files that you want us to look at and translate, but crowding will not touch the rest. And basically, the same for translations. This way we know where to take the source files, like where they are you know, placed on a GitHub, on the wrapper. And a translated file path, it's about translations. Like uh, you can tell crowding that, hey, I want my translations to be placed into this folder that I want to have a language code name to understand that, okay, it's a rabbit localization, it's German, it's Japanese. And again, you can play with the path, you can play with the different patterns, you can, you know, combine it in a way that is, you know, just perfect for you. Here we go. And of course we have, you know, we can have a lot of, a lot of file filters like that. So it's not only, you know, the single path that you can indicate, it's it's multiple path to different um, for different file types for different places you can you know you can have it all together everything that I you know that I set up here will be saved actually it is saved as crowning YAML file on my github wrapper so I can always I can always add my configuration not only in crowding but also in github repository on my master branch so basically that's it what's you know what's needed just to set up the integration and if to talk about synchronization rules, uh, integration is fully automated, but you can also you know, change the default settings if you don't like them. For example, the source files, the source keys that you would keep on your, uh, on your repository, they would be automatically uploaded to crowding for localization. If you would update the source value on a GitHub, it's also, um, it's also going to be updated in crowding. Um, and for translation, it's kind of the same. Whenever we have translation in crowding, it's going to be uh, pushed back to the repository up to one hour. It's a default setting. If you want to make it faster, you can use 10 minute schedule or you can even use sync now button. Well, it's a manual stuff, a manual way. If you don't want to get those, you know, frequent updates from crowding, a lot of comments from us saying that you have new translations, you can set up, let's say, a time schedule once per day. I mean, if it's okay to you and you don't want to get, you know, uh, spam with their comments, uh, it, it's good to have it this way. I'm going to set up to the 10 minute schedule, you know, just to just to have it there. Um, plus, if you don't want crowding to push any translations to your repository at all, like it's good to have source files, you know, pushed into crowding, but you don't want to get any translations, you can disable this option and we will keep syncing your resources, but we will not, you know, send you uh, comments with a translation. So it's up to you how to make it work. So, yeah, that's why I say that it takes like up to five minutes to set it up if you have, you know, like a, if you have a prepared uh, repository with source files. Um, it's also a few more options here, like you can set up like a pattern for, for the new branches, you know, automatically added into crowding for localization. Uh, you just need a pattern and then whenever you create a new feature branch, it will be automatically set up for localization in crowding. You would not need to manually tickle it or somehow, you know, um, edit it, it will be done, you know, automatically. So just want maybe to show you guys how it would look like on GitHub. Uh, in the meanwhile, we have a translated question. 
okay. from uh, Ukrainian. Uh, so is there a, a limitation for, for massive of data which you have in crowded? Um, well, you know, we have private companies, you know, who, who buy subscriptions. So yes, they have some limitations, how many keys they can push into crowding and translate. But for open source projects, we have an open source license, which is for free. And we also have a free package and educational license. So there we don't have any limits. You can push as many files as you need, as many branches as you need, as many keys as you need. So I would say nope. Cool. Uh, I hope this uh, satisfied the question. Uh, I also had like a lot of questions about things that we've seen before. I think that. First of all, I really love the tool. I just read about it when we started talking about this event. So basically it's new to me also. Uh, you talked about like, uh, for me, so I write, uh, my mother tongue is Hebrew. So mm -hmm. we also are uh, writing the other way around from right to left instead of uh, left to right. So a lot of RTL problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with it. Uh, and basically, uh, one of the things that I thought about is uh, sometimes even the dates, like the date format, or uh, let's say, for example, currency or um, weight, height, mm -hmm. can change, can vary, what, what we call locale, which is on top of localization, of course. So are you doing anything for that? Can I uh, suggest, for example, uh, like an equation for a variable that will change depending on the la the language or localization. Um, yep, but I think it's mostly linked to the source file type because in order to provide, you know, in, in order for the translator to be able to to submit those, you know, uh, different variants of translation, um, it would be necessary also to pay attention to the file type because because some file types they have this native. Um, attributes or special file structure that would allow developers to construct source files in a way that translator can, can submit this translation i mean this variance translation mm -hmm. so maybe i cannot you know like give you a straight answer like yes or no but if the file type supports you know those special attributes or those special things then in crowding translator will be always able to provide uh, the uh, you know those variance translation for example uh, again, the plural forms for Arabic, again, it's only about, you know, singular plural forms, but we know that Arabic has like this many options. So we automatically provide translators, you know, with an ability to provide this few suggestions. Um, gender specific things, currency, date and time, it's usually done through the ICU syntax. So again, it depends like how the uh, source files are being constructed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right. I it sounds a bit complicated, so, but is it possible to just just out of curiosity because of this whole thing? So, <laughs> is it possible, sorry, uh, to create like an optional variable that might change between languages? Uh, um, something that might be missing, for example. Or... Um, for like translator cannot do that because they don't have enough rights. Because mm -hmm. usually, you know, uh, if translator would do that and project manager cannot control it, it might end up in an application being crashed. I mean, of course, you know, I'm, I'm dramatic a little bit, but it's mm -hmm. open plans. So for translator, they don't have such an option, unfortunately. But for those people who work with the, um, with the resources who generate source files, they have an ability to provide, you know, some special construction so then translators could submit you know those those different variables but for translators no unfortunately no nice pretty cool okay so we have like one last question for now and then i'll let you go on for a few minutes <laughs> so uh from our developer circle so um uh, casimir asked if i want to use crowding for localization for my project should it be open sourced um, no, no, it shouldn't be open source. I just mentioned that we, that we do have special open source li uh, license, but we also have a free package where you can have unlimited number of public projects. So you're welcome to go ahead. No need to have open source uh, like wrap or something. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, okay. 
uh, let's see. Oh, we did have a discussion about the GitHub, and I just really, really, you know, very quickly wanted to show you that you will get pull requests from crowding like that, new crowding updates. You can open it, you can look through the comments. If you like them, then you perform a merge to your base branch. Um, you, you would have also like the file name and also the, the target language you're having comment for. And if you like everything, you can always create a merge request to your master branch, to develop branch, you know, whatever is, uh, is topical. But I would always recommend squashing and merging because, you know, just to group all those comments and your history will not be, you know, get, get all uh, set with, with crowding comments. And one more thing, when you get translations from crowding to GitHub wrapper or any wrapper that, you know, any service that you're using, um, I would always recommend deleting this temporary service or as we call it localization branch because next time you're going to have new translations, crowding would create a new branch. So it's a process like that. We get translations from crowding, we review them, we merge them, we delete this temporary branch, and we wait for the new translations to come again to the um, uh, to the repository. And when I was talking about uh, uh, about agile localization, I also wanted to say that it's not only the source files, right, that we translate because we have them extracted from the code and everything. I mean, let's imagine a situation that we don't have source files at all. We just have our designer, right? Right, created a mock-up or something, so we would know how how those you know beautiful things would look like uh, to the end users. So I just wanted to say that in crowding, it's possible to start localization simply having the mock-ups. If you guys are using Figma, Sketch, Adobe XD, um, you can ask your designers to push those beautiful mock-ups into crowding, translate them, and then your designers would have um, completed localized versions. What I wanted to show you right now in this project, I also got a, I also got a Figma here, you know, for a very quick uh, test. Uh, this is a frame, like a basic one, and I use crowding plugin in order to, you know, in order just just to push those mockups that I have into crowding for localization. So this very thing right now is already uploaded into my project. So I'm going to check how it looks like for, for translators. Um, and what does this plugin do? It scans the, the frame from the Figma, Adobe XD, or Sketch. And for translators, it's really cool because they have the whole picture. They don't have single keys with no context, right? They have the whole picture. They can translate it. They, they can, you know, they can see how it looks like. And what is more important, they can preview the German localization, Japanese hybrid localization, and they can understand, you know, uh, whether it fits, whether it's okay, uh, whether nothing, you know, was corrupted or everything. And then when translations are being done, I just use Google, you know, to make it fast. Um, we just open the plugin and we, uh, we sync translations back to Figma. In this way, designers, they can also have localized versions uh, of the frames. They don't need to wait till, let's say, some source keys would be translated and then somehow it will be integrated on the website and, all, and only then they you know, open the landing page and they can see, oh my God, French localization does not fit into my button. No, no need you know, to wait uh, for that stuff. Uh, while developers extracting the keys and uh, translate them, the same, is possible for designers. So they created a frame, they pushed it into crowding, and they had it back. And they can see that, oh, German localization, just perfect. No need to adjust anything, no need to make work shorter, you know, and things like that. So yeah, it's just an idea that localization might start at any point. So uh, including the design part, development part, quality assurance, and just the idea itself. Um, talking about that, I would also just, you know, would like to mention that it's not only like the GitHub and like uh, design tools that we have integrations with, nope. Uh, crowding is actually um, a tool that might be really nice for, um, uh, for support team management, like, you know, the knowledge base, like Zendesk and Wix sensors, also about apps description, like Google Play, App Store description and stuff like that. Uh, we do have, um, we do have like the whole marketplace of different localization things. 
which can be used, um, the integrations can be used, you know, just to make the whole process really nice and really smooth for each part, for each role. What I mean here, we have integrations for developers definitely just to make their life easier, but we also have, you know, like really nice to have integrations for project managers to make their life easier, uh, including Dropbox, you know, Google Play, uh, for tag guys, for content writers, we've got Contentful, and I mean, a lot of, a lot of different stuff which you can pick up um and simply you know using your localization project you don't need to pay extra for those integrations you know even in free package uh i think api uh all of the plugins you know they are being already included so i just you know really encourage you to give it a try um okay what i got here oh if you guys are wondering how to start maybe you don't have you know anything prepared for localization um again it would be maybe enough just to have your source files I know that maybe it, it's not so easy, you know, as it sounds to get your source file, you know, to get it from the code. But once you have at least something or even the mockups, you know, uh, it's really easy, you know, just, just to start doing that. So um, it's either files. If you don't have files, but you have, you know, multiple keys, we've got a string based API. So we can also, you know, go into experiments and, and uh, play with things a little bit. Basically, if you don't want to get into any technical integrations at all, you can simply push your files manually, like drag and drop them from your computer or create files online in Chromium, like a spreadsheet files. It's also possible. Or if you have your files or your keys on Google Drive, or like a Excel spreadsheet, you can also just use Google Drive integration, you know, and, um, and just push it back into Chromium, back and forth of the systems. Um, yep. Uh, I'll uh, join in. I'll jump in for a few questions. Sure. Uh, so, how do you become a reviewer for an open source GitHub project? Uh, reviewer. Oh, um, if it's a crowdsource project, let's say like Electron uh, from the GitHub, or for example, uh, Minecraft. Um, usually, it's a project manager of the project who might notice that you're like really active contributor and you're doing a lot and they can make you a proofreader. I mean, you cannot become a proofreader on your own, simply like, hey, I want to be a proofreader and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, you would need an approval of the project manager. But if you really want to be the person, you know, who, who's really passionate about that, you can leave a comment to, to the project manager saying, hey, I'm so dedicated, please make me a proofreader because I want to, you know, I want to improve the quality of translations. So it can be done right here in the comment section. Um, if you're worried that the project manager might not notice, you know, the comment that, that you want to become a proofreader, uh, each project in Crowding have this contact information of the project owner and managers. And you can always contact these people sending a request for being a proofreader. Uh, but again, even being a translator, you can still become a proofreader because you can upvote a downvote, you know, for uh, for translations done by other people. A proofreader's role it means you can validate, like you decide this this translation is going to be taken for export. But as a translator, you can simply like and dislike the translations by other people. All right. Uh, another question from Anna Lichner. Linchuk. So, mm -hmm. what is the what is the effect of voting for the translation if the translated text already in the master branch? Um, so what is the? I'm sorry, just would need to repeat uh, that. What's the? What What does it do if I like vote a translation while it's already in a, in the master branch? Um, what's the effect on it? Well, if translation is already merged, let's say you. you you got a string translated, you merge the translation, and then somebody is voting saying, hey, your merge translation is not okay. This one, the next one is better. Like, and it has a lot of those upvotes, like 15, 100. Um, then crowding would send you the um, a pull request with a new translation, like proposing that new translation would override the translation that you already, already have in master branch. But it really depends it really depends on the process that you have in your project because you, for example, can set the special uh, export option that you want, for example, export only approved translations. So what I'm saying here, um, 
it's really a lot to talk about. It depends on your workflow, but if you already have a merge translation and somebody says another translation is better, I think uh, I'm pretty sure GitHub will send you a new pull request with a new proposed translation, which you can either deny or accept. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, is that it? Um, okay, then let's let's go ahead. I mean, this is the last thing for today, I promise. I know that I guess everybody's pretty tired after work today. It's a in context for web apps. I mean, uh, for the last hour, I've been talking, you know, how, how it's easy to translate in crowding and everything, but what is more easier even, or even um, maybe better, it's in context localization. Let's imagine your translators don't need to log in into crowding and they don't need to work with single keys translation. What they can do instead, they can open your website and translate every button on your website. Well, it sounds like a paradise and actually it is, especially for translators and for project managers who don't need to upload screenshot and provide extra context information. Um, in context localization, uh, it's this thing that basically looks like that. It's an example of Microsoft MakeCode project. They have their website placed uh, under, uh, under Mirror website, and they translate everything using in context. So their translators, they, they don't use, you know, they don't log it into coding and translate single keys. They come up here, they pick up the language they want, you know, to, to make some contributions for, and then they simply pick up the, the, like, the string they would like to translate, and they provide the translation like that. They can save it. And I mean, this way they can have the whole context, the whole uh, length issues, the whole, I don't know, visual representation covered, because this way it's really easier you know, to translate rather than looking into single keys. Uh, this technology, it works for web applications and it requires a little bit of help of the developer to make it work, but it's not so complicated, really it's not. And uh, such teams as like Microsoft, we also have other customers like private companies who use this technology. I'm afraid I cannot you know, sh share it with you right now, but for Microbit, it was really cool. A lot, of, uh, a lot of translations were done in this special environment. And I know the translators, I mean, they really like it because they don't need to, to look into the, um, into that. They don't need to work like with, with keys and tags. They work with the UI, right? They have everything on their plate and they can see like what they're doing. Um, if you guys may be interested, was it something like that might work for mobile apps? I think, yeah, in Croding, we do have special SDK for Android and for iOS right now, just for these two. That would also have like this special preview option for translators on their mobiles or in the emulators that would basically have the same environment. It's like a mirror project, but every button, every option on your website is being clickable, is being translatable. So basically, translators are really happy having that option. Um, okay. And I guess that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening uh, for such a long time to my talking. I hope I did not bore you. hope everything is, was clear. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that if there are any kind of questions, I am you know more than happy to answer them. And please feel free to drop you know any comments uh, on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, yeah, I can also personally answer anything, everything you know uh, on comments after after the session. All right. Uh, for now, it seems that we've answered everything. I okay, think. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. I loved it. Uh, it's super relevant for me because I'm working on one end, I'm working on iOS apps, so like tons of them. So I need that I need a tool like this because I've al I've already like failed localizing even even when I am the translator, because I know like two languages. Uh, so most of us here are uh, bilingual, at least. So we know at least two languages. So for for all of us, it's super relevant. Uh, so it was really cool. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, thanks for the other hosts that helped me. Tomka, Enzo, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
and I'll see you next time. Yep. Bye. Bye.